Hello friends. I'm so pleased again to be with you today and to be privileged to share with you some approaches to conflict in the life of the church. Let me start with an illustration. You remember the movie Chariots of Fire with Vangelis Music, where we see the Christian witness and conviction of Eric Liddell in the context of the 1924 Summer Olympics. He refused to run in the race that was his specialty, a race he almost certainly would have won because of his Christian belief about the Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. Just before he ran the 400-meter race, which he did win on another day, someone handed him a quote from the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel that said, He that honors me, I will honor. There's a memorial set up in 1945 in Scotland where his memory is still celebrated that shows him in that strange way in which he raced with his head back, his mouth open, his arms flailing and grasping. In one race where he lagged far behind, one spectator said to his friend, it looked like Liddell would not, would not win this one. And the other one replied, ach, but he's no put his head back yet. Liddell did that, did win that race, and he came on strong. When I run, Liddell often said, I feel his pleasure. I want to ask you this morning, when is it that you feel God's pleasure? For my thesis is this, that when we know how the Spirit breathes life in and out through us uniquely and specifically, when He uses us, when you feel those sacred moments, then you, you'll be hungry for more and more of God's presence. But having used this illustration this morning, I want to jump to point out that, that we're not running the race set before us merely as individuals who are all alone with God. We're, we're individuals and we are a community of faith. We're racing with others, running together and sharing in the purposes and plans of God. It's not just about you and me as independent souls. It's about us. There's no church of one. It's us together, even if sometimes us may be only two or three, and Jesus makes four. I read recently, the goal of the gospel is not to affirm us, celebrate us, and accept us. The goal of the gospel is to rescue us, transform us, and redirect us. And so it is that sometimes God's pleasure comes when we see someone running a race with us who falls, the one among us stops to help. Or someone gets lost in the marathon route and another slows down to wave him back onto the right path. Some stop short of the goal, thinking they've already finished, and the one who could have won handily stops to push the faster one ahead over the goal line ahead of them. We don't have to win to feel God's pleasure. We just get to participate to give our best, and it will still feel the joy. We've been talking about conflict in the life of the church, but also so in the context of the church God blesses. The church is the people of God, the household of faith. When I first began to pray and think about these sermons, I thought of the more positive aspects of our life together and also the negative ones. But anyone can be narrow and negative about church life and the failures we often make and the problems we face. I wanted also to think about the church God blesses. I thought that might be better than a series entitled The Church God Doesn't Like Very Much. So we have been considering together some of the actions of a local church that knows the favor of God, that again we will not shy away from discussing more negative aspects. And so this morning we want to think together about how we can be a relationally healthy church. And I'm thinking particularly of this in the context of St. Paul calling a local church the body of Christ. What's this? Well, all of us who have been born of the Spirit and adopted into the family of God to join together as the people of God in this great and grand house of faith have also become members, as it were, of Christ's body. And in this body, in these relationships, the way we are together is key. There must be harmony and balance if there is to be health. There must be humility, acceptance and mutual appreciation, and lots of forgiveness at times. As conflict arises in the body, just as disease enters into any natural body, there comes the need for help and for healing, for forgiveness and restoration. When one part is hurt, we all suffer. When several parts are injured, the body may be almost paralyzed. Attempts to help one issue may create another issue. Doctors know this. It calls for wisdom and the help of our Lord, the great doctor, the great physician. And again, sometimes it's best to leave the scene altogether, but not necessarily. For differences, even fights, may be opportunities for the whole body to change and to grow, and not necessarily because others are changed the way we want them to be, but because we are. 
Perhaps we were hurt way long ago. We can't seem to get over it, get past it. Memories are still fresh and raw. People carry guilt and its effects over years, sometimes through a lifetime. C.S. Lewis reminded us that sin and guilt consequences do not just pass away with the passing of the years. But we can't go back and mend things or be mended, can we? Well, in a sense, we can. Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, is with us now as he was with us then when that evil happened. And taking his hand, or as he takes ours, we can return in our memories, maybe with a caring Christian friend's help and soulmate, or through the help of counseling or a wise Christian ministry. And gently and gingerly, we can revisit that time where we hurt others or others hurt us. I came into you books on the Christian healing of memories. And our elders have also been reading Pastor Peter Scazzaro's book, Emotionally Healthy Relationships. I commend them for that, because as spiritual leaders, they really are working hard at this, I think, seeking to know how best to give the leadership this body needs in this in-between transitional time in Kingsway's history. Pray for them, and our new interim pastor, the Reverend Dale Rose, as he begins his ministry with us. Today I'm thinking, how much conflict would be avoided if we knew of and took seriously God's strategy of putting us together in one body with different member parts? and with gifts to contribute. It works similarly to how our natural body works as we walk and think and stretch and run, as it protects or rids us of viruses and even in our being able to scratch our nose. For sometimes the problem at the core of a lot of conflict in the church is something I simply call gift clash. The parts and members of the body are out of joint, the arm is making a fist and punching itself in the nose. When we don't know or appreciate how we're a member of the Christ body as a local church, when we don't know our role, where we fit our part, and how it best functions, then it's almost inevitable that there will be conflict, body elements, and pain. This image and metaphor of the body of Christ, I believe, is the genius way to describe how a church is best to function in its mission and in its ministry. We use the phrase body of Christ often, but I think we fail to grasp how profoundly helpful is the metaphor in both an individual Christian and corporate sense. It's how the cause of Christ is advanced, and God's purposes, as promised to faithful Abraham, get accomplished. Something is being taught here that is of more import than how a nominating committee goes about finding relatively few needed in the body who will serve on this or that committee or fulfill the necessary offices. That's necessary, I say, and the government requires it. But there's much more to this body life metaphor if we but understand and appreciate how we're uniquely called, gifted, as is necessary to the health and fruitful functioning of a local church. Do you remember how the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthian church, which was a sick body, divided, unbalanced, quarreling, out of sorts? And Paul included in his missive a rebuke to those early birds who gathered at the regular agape communion meal, most of them richer because they were eating most of the bread and drinking up most of the wine, so that there was little or none left for the poorer folk, who were necessarily late, coming after work, some of them as slaves. Paul writes that in doing that, they were failing to discern the body. We think he's referring to the profound truth of Jesus' presence in their communion time together. As it were, through the sacrament and symbols, we eat and drink of his body, his blood, and receive of his life. But Paul is also saying that in not caring enough to wait, they are not discerning the body of Christ, which is also comprised of their poorer fellow members. I wish we would discern more Jesus' body, too. That as we click on the Zoom link and come to see friends and fellow members, and whenever we can return to the sanctuary again, that we'll pause and remember the profound truth, this is the body of Christ. Paul notes that the growth of the body is enhanced by specific leadership gifts or functions. And he writes in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, that Christ himself gave apostles and prophets, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Here are five functions or gifts, not necessarily, I say, of the office of pastor, as we think of that today. They're not necessarily offices, but their functions are still needed. 
An apostle's gift of leadership, among other things, often gives the ability to have the overview of the whole situation, perhaps in the church community and also in the community. She thinks often more globally than locally and encourages others in coordinated efforts. The prophetic gift gives some the ability to know the times of what the church should do. Maybe our young people have this gift. I think the gift is not something to just keep to ourselves and put in our pocket. It is the way the Holy Spirit flows in and through us how he tends to come to us and we get to know and it's similar for us in a gifted way. But sometimes that gift is thrown off, of course, by social media, news headlines. The evangelism gift is that which enables people to tell the story of Jesus in a winsome way that often results in others coming to know and love and serve Jesus. And I think today perhaps that art and music and writing also can help this gift be channeled and expressed. The gift of pastor and teacher functions within a particular church where, like a shepherd, this gifted one knows each member sheep. He visits, teaches, and encourages. She helps people to grow in their disciple walk. And I think one has to be a strong call, have to have a strong call in these days to be a pastor in the context of many of our churches. It's an almost impossible task at times, given the unrealistic, unbiblical expectations within many churches. No pastor has all the gifts, but sometimes we posit that maybe they should. Many church quarrels stem from unawareness, I think, and misunderstanding of what now is a pastor to be doing in the life of the church. Pastors are given to the body to equip God's people for works of service, not to do the works of service for them. Further, we don't want to have a hireling, someone hired to do the ministry. Jesus warned about the hireling as opposed to having a shepherd, a good shepherd who knows us knows the flock, goes after those who are missing. I understand the denominational and government rules about all of this HR needs, process, proper process, accountability, human rights issues, important as that is. But at heart, we want a shepherd who will nurture and guide and heal and help us to do the work God has for us, each one, and all of us together. Sometimes a pastor may be more of an evangelist, but not passionate about pastoral visitation. And boy, do we keep track. Or the prophetic, great preachers and writers, perhaps, as was A.W. Tozer years ago here in Toronto. But he was like other introverted pastors I have met through the years. They were excellent in the pulpit, but introverted and shy and not at all comfortable talking when they're not in the pulpit. Can't make conversation in a small context, perhaps. It's said that a, a, a Tozer on occasion didn't even recognize his own elder or elders when he passed on the street. But I'm still reading his books and being very much helped by them. I think there's something profound in what one of my seminary profs once said. I'd rather hear the pastoral candidate pray than preach. So we all have our opinions about what we could or should be looking for in the search for the next pastor. But rather than point out what's lacking in any particular pastor, couldn't we show up and add to what might be missing once they come among us and we see that? Could we not supplement those necessary areas of the work that are not her strength, getting the help needed from others within the gifted membership that we already know about, those gifts? Helping, filling in blanks, working with, encouraging, visiting, discipling, training, sometimes preaching. Remember Ken Fu's great illustration a few weeks ago that we're not, on the bu we're not on the bus of ministry and mission. We are the bus. We are the bus. And Paul says, we are the body. He writes in Romans 12, 3 following, By the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. Teaching, then teach. If it's courage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. There's another metaphor I often use, as you know, that of a local church being very much like an orchestra with particular symphonies to be played in this corner of the globe. The symphony is composed of various instruments. 
The, the orchestra has brass and wind instruments and string and percussion. And the pastor is the director, the symphony leader. He or she with the baton may or may not even know how to play any one of the instruments. The pastor director knows how best to pull the best and the beauty of the music and mission out of each person, each part, each instrument, each member, and together the whole. Last week, revolving door image reminded us that the church both gathers and scatters. Thank God it's Monday. And I think some of our gifted members function best when we're gathered as we minister to one another, and others of us best when we scatter as we go out to our world. But you know, in either case, some gifts in gifted members may be lying dormant. They're asleep. The gift is as yet unopened, unnoticed, untried. The joy and pleasure of the Spirit meeting us and others never yet experienced. It's like that time in the Gospel narrative when Jesus in the little hamlet of Nairn came across a funeral possession for the only son of a widow. However would she survive now? Her husband gone, her son gone. But Jesus said he's not dead, he's just sleeping, and raised him up. Oh, that Jesus would awaken the sleeper we sometimes are, and wake up our gifts as well within. You know, I believe it's the primary responsibility of under-shepherds, of the great shepherd of the flock, that is, pastors and leaders in the church, to help people discover where they fit as members of the body, and what is their gift to contribute. Sometimes we already know, sometimes we need help finding that out. It's what I call 3D ministry. Each member's gift is to be discovered, and then developed, and then deployed. Some examples, maybe. I think of people at Kingsway back through the years who had obvious gifts, whether or not they ever thought of them as such. I remember those whose passion and gift was in opening their homes to new people, to other people in the church, and also others in the community. They had the gift of hospitality. Some folk just naturally or supernaturally, jump in to assist whenever obvious tasks are before them, when they're asked, sometimes when they're not asked, and that's okay. They had the gift of helps. I think of Bill and Phil and Russell and others who were always fixing something around the church or the church house. I smile and I, often, I, I even use Russ's phrase, Russ's phrase that we must press on rewardless instead of regardless because both sentiments are true, we press on sometimes rewardless and regardless. We all are to give faithfully of our resources and time, but some have given abundantly and are able to do so. I have a friend who has this gift of stewardship, and I know he thinks and prays about it a lot as he helps financially Christian organizations to get started or to continue locally and globally. And he tells me, Lord, I have to plan and pray over the many asks that I get many sometimes in a week, to know what the Lord wants me to do, how to share with my resources, how to respond, yes or no, and if positively, with how much. As much, he said, as you do in preparing your sermons. Silly me, I'd never ever thought of that before. I was moved when he told me. There are many, many more examples, and we don't have time, but here's one more from the New Testament. The man's name was Joseph, and he had lots of money and land. And when he came to faith and joined the church, he saw that the fledgling church needed what he could bring to the table, and it was scads of money, which would help the poor and others as they got established. And the already itinerant ministry, continuing of the disciples as Jesus and his disciples had been helped by others. So Joseph sold all his land holdings on the island of Cyprus and came and laid the proceeds at the disciples' feet. And also, time and again, in many ways it seems that aren't recorded, he gave of himself to the church. So much so that Joseph soon got the name bar Nabus, the son of encouragement. They called him Mr. Encouragement, if you will. Money helps, it's needed, but even if we have little, we do have time, and we can always be giving of ourselves to others. You remember that he had a falling out, did Barnabas, with Paul as to whether or not to take John Mark with them again on their second missionary journey. Paul hadn't much time for the idea, for it seemed that Mark had bailed out on their earlier voyage. But Barnabas, who always saw the best in folk, not the worst, wanted to give Mark another chance to accompany them to prove himself, and they quarreled about it. Even saints are falling out in the New Testament. 
Barnabas may well have reminded Paul that he'd spoken up for him in the Jerusalem church, giving him a chance to join them when the whole church demurred (laughs) no way, thinking that Paul was a wolf in sheep's clothing after his zealous persecution of the fledgling church for so long and up to that time. You know, frankly, I'd, I'd rather be a Barnabas than a Paul. I think all the gifts are needed, but especially this gift of encouragement, and maybe especially at this time in our church. In this instance, it seems that Paul's apostolic leadership gifts clashed with the more pastoral and encouragement gifts of Barnabas, and they agreed to part ways. But I'm sure God's abundant grace followed them both in their respective continuing work. The point of our being the body of Christ is that we will come to look and act like Jesus. Christian spiritual formation is the process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. The more we're like Jesus, the more we're fully human, the more we are the renewed creatures as per God's intent for humans in the first place on this planet. And to be like Jesus, we are given the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. And to do, to act like Jesus, we are given the gifts of the Spirit in the body. Thus we continue His likeness and His presence, His saving, healing, loving activity in our world today, and we continue His work. That's how Luke, in his book, The Acts of the Apostles, which we also call the Acts of the Holy Spirit, introduces and then shows how the early church continued the work of Jesus, which he began to do while on earth, and he continued through the apostles. And now we, too, are writing and living out the 29th chapter of the book of Acts, or maybe it's the millionth chapter for all I know. The Acts of Kingsway Baptist Church, more importantly still, the continuing work and acts of God's Holy Spirit through us. Through our gifts given, the Holy Spirit continues the divine purposes with Jesus, the head of the body, and the Spirit, the body's life breath, its strength and power. Maybe the lungs in a body are those who pray well, breathe in and out the Spirit into the ministry we have. It was the Spirit who enabled Jesus in all that he did while on earth. His ministry was utterly derived. He was utterly dependent on the Spirit. When asked, when challenged, when pressed, he said, There's not my words, they're the words of him who sent me. Not my works, pointing to the work of the Holy Spirit. Not my will, but yours, Father, he said in Gethsemane, before the cross. This is the only way God's work and way is accomplished in our individual and corporate lives. It's by God's Spirit in and through a gifted member, body, that is Jesus, local churches, here and there, dotted throughout the world. Each one of us, each member, and each local body, like Jesus, must be dependent, filled by the Spirit, not grieving the Spirit, if God is to accomplish God's purposes in and through us, in the places and tasks before us. There's something special about the fact that God established this church and this community nearly 75 years ago. Our work for God, I don't think, is yet complete. I think that God wants to continue his work here and now through us, extending the story of Jesus through our gifted lives as the continuing acts of the Spirit. Despite all our warts and our wars and our harsh words at times, beyond the obvious blemishes and battles, our skirmishes and our skittishness, in spite of us, but always, God is with us helping, and we shall overcome. To that end, here's a few verses from an old hymn with words ever new for this body. Our blessed Redeemer, ere he breathed his tender last farewell, a guide, a comforter, bequeathed with us to dwell. He came in semblance of a dove, with sheltering wings outspread, the holy balm of peace and love on earth to shed. He came in tongues of living flame, to teach, convince, subdue. All powerful as the wind he came, as invisible too. He came sweet influence to impart a gracious willing guest, while he can find one humble heart wherein to rest. And his that gentle voice we hear, soft as the breath of even, that checks each fault, that calms each fear, and speaks of heaven. And every virtue we possess, and every conquest won, and every thought of holiness, are his alone. Spirit of purity and grace, our weakness pitying see. O make our hearts thy dwelling place, and worthier thee. 
Amen.